Um, this is the API integrations and marketplaces track, and uh, we're going to be kicking off talking about healthcare. Oh, Shelby's here. Shelby, you need to hit the share my audio and video button at the top, and uh, and then you'll be in the room. There you are. <laughs> hello. Hello, hello. Um, so, Shelby's going to be talking about um, healthcare interoperability. Actually, a topic that um, her and I have uh, collaborated on a little bit in the past. I could say collaborate is probably too strong a word. She has contributed um, to a report that I write um, called The State of API Integration. So, um, this is uh, a great topic. I'm excited to hear um, where the world has taken us since, uh, since we last discussed this. It's good to see you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're kind of uh, past our official start point, so I'm just going to hand it over to you. The the share button to share your screen is um, that other little icon with the the line through it there. Okay. And uh, when you're ready, I will pass the stage to you. Okay, great. Can you see my first slide? We can. Perfect. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Excellent, thank you much. All right, so um, my name is Shelby Switzer. I'm here to talk about healthcare interoperability from buzzword to APIs. I'll just start by giving you a little bit of background about me. Um, my handle on Twitter is Switzerly if you wanna chat at me later. Um, I'm currently a software engineer with the United States Digital Service, specifically stationed at the Department of Health and Human Services. You can check us out at usds.gov. And our Twitter handle, USDS, is just at USDS. Um, just a little bit of background about USDS. We are a nonpartisan agency within the White House. We were started by President Obama. And um, we came out of the um, And we are essentially a bunch of private sector technologists who have brought their expertise into government for term delimited service. So from anywhere from one to four years. Um, and we work with agencies to help them modernize their technology, fight fires, and build new user-centered products. Um, I also have a background generally in civic tech and healthcare integrations and interoperabilities and APIs overall. Um, and I have my own civic tech blog, civicunrest.com, where I write when I'm not heads down in projects. So why am I here? I'm here because we are two decades um, or, and more into healthcare technology innovation. We are 10 years past meaningful use and the mandate that technology and electronic health records has to be interoperable, um, but we're still seeing that healthcare technology is not interoperable and it's not user focused. And this is a huge burden, not only on patients, but on the American public. And I don't know about y'all, but for me, you know, the past few months have felt like many years um, and I'm here partly, too, because I've been working on um, some specific projects related to the COVID response um, from a government perspective. And I've known that healthcare interoperability has been a big problem for a long time, but I've really seen how difficult it is during our current pandemic response to have to deal with the very real problems of data exchange and data interoperability. Um, so this picture is a picture of clinical data, case data, lab results, that are piling up at a local jurisdiction, a public health department, and they have to be faxed by one person to other jurisdictions to help manage cases and help respond to the virus. And this is a reality that so many people across the United States and probably the world are facing is that just to exchange basic data about people who are being affected, who are affected by the virus um, is, is still a paper process. And even when it's systems based, there's still some level of manual intervention that has to happen and it's been um, incredibly both depressing to see, um, unsurprising uh, based on what I'd already known about healthcare coming into this, um, but in some ways also really inspiring to see the amount of hard work and creativity uh, that people at all levels of the data collection spectrum and all levels of the pandemic response, um, the creativity that they've employed to get past some of these hurdles. So today, what I'm gonna talk about is I'm gonna talk about interoperability and APIs in healthcare um, the journey to interoperability, how we get from the concept of interoperability to APIs, um, because I'm going to argue that interoperability isn't enough. So what is interoperability in healthcare? Well, we can start with a noun. 
Um, the dictionary definition from Merriam-Webster is the ability of a system, such as a weapon system, to work with or use the parts or equipment of another system. So weirdly, every dictionary I looked in used the weapon system as an example. I don't know why. Um, luckily, we're not talking about weapons. We're talking about healthcare. Um, and I think that in general, um, you know, this is a good a good place to start from. But from a software perspective, you know, we are talking about interoperability is the ability of a system to work with or use parts or functionality of another system. And from a modern software perspective, what we talk about usually when we talk about interoperability is APIs. And we also talk about standards. So even HTTP, JSON, XML, um, to more advanced protocols and standards like OAuth. Um, standards are kind of a big part of the interoperability conversation as well as usability. So we can talk about the message format and how data is structured and shaped and how it's sent, but the data itself also has to be usable. Um, it has to be usable in the way that it's structured and sent, and also it just has to be good data. Uh, does it have identifiers? Is it linked if you're getting multiple sets of tabular data? Do you know what the fields mean? And then also when we talk about interoperability, we usually have some consideration of security, um, authorization, authentication, um, making sure that there, there are considerations around security and uptime and performance um, from a service perspective as well as just an access perspective. So this shouldn't be new to you. I've probably heard of these things. It's probably how you talk about APIs. Um, and that this is the case in most modern software industries, which is that the conversation isn't really about interoperability. In fact, I hardly ever hear that word outside of healthcare because the conversation is about APIs. And it's about API strategy and lifecycle management. And that can look like this. Um, so this is a diagram of what API lifecycle looks like from Red Hat. Thanks, Red Hat. Um, and you know, there's a lot of steps to it. And I think there's some things to note here. Um, and this, again, is probably also familiar to a lot of people in the crowd. Um, some important things to note here are that this is a continuous cycle of product development. The why is present from the beginning to the end. We start with strategy and we end with monetization. So we're always thinking about why we're doing this. Um, we incorporate standards into things in the sections like design. We have users as part of this cycle. Um, we have a specific um, specific step for consumption and like getting users on board. Um, we're also potentially getting user feedback during this design and mocking and testing phase. Um, they're not just some assumption. Users aren't some kind of, you know, we, we just assume there's going to be users and hopefully we'll plan for them later and we'll get feedback from them. Um, it, it's actually just a real part of the cycle. That's something to call out here. And finally, discovery and promotion matter. Um, so number nine, discover. So people have to discover your API. You have to make your API discoverable. You want people to be using it, um, which is not necessarily the case of some APIs we see in healthcare, interestingly enough. So in healthcare, interoperability does not equal APIs. Healthcare interoperability um, is much more narrowly focused. This comes from HIMSS. So HIMSS is the Healthcare Information and Management System Society. They run a big conference every year that unfortunately was canceled this year due to the pandemic that's happening, obviously. Um, and this is how th they have published the thinking around interoperability. And it's not just them. This is just how people are thinking about it whenever you have conversations in healthcare about interoperability. Um, we're talking about four levels. Foundational, so basic requirements to securely communicate data between systems. Structural, um, format, syntax, organization of the data exchange. Semantic, underlying resource models, codification of the data shared definitions and vocabulary, as well as organizational, which is the governance, policy, social, legal, and organizational considerations. And what this looks like in implementation are unfortunately a bunch of acronyms. Uh, that's just healthcare and government, sadly. Uh, so at the foundational level, we could be talking about HTTPS, we could be talking about setting up VPN connections, SFTP and FTPS, um, structurally, we're talking about things like CSV, EDI, XML, and JSON. Um, and we're also kind of getting into some more interesting stuff like HL7, V2, and um, unfamiliar, HL7 is a standard for data exchange in healthcare. Um, and 
V2 is basically EDI and V3 is XML based. Um, and they these formats basically define the structure in which you send data um, and health messages. Um, and they kind of bleed over into the semantic. Um, so that's why I have them in semantic as well, um, because they do define certain elements and they have some expectations around what goes where and what those things mean. However, those things, those rules are so loosely applied that in reality, they're not very much help semantically. And just because you implement HL7 v2.5.1 doesn't mean that you actually are sharing semantics with another system that does the same thing. Um, at a semantic level, we do see FHIR making more of an effort towards that and defining resource models um, and trying to get towards standardization in a more modern way. Um, and we also have the new USCDI, which is the United States Core Data for Interoperability, which is part of the Cures Act that just came out. And we can talk, we're going to talk about that a bit more later, um, but that's essentially defining data elements um, that are required for any sort of interoperable data exchange. Um, and finally, organizationally, we're talking about business associates agreements, memorandum of understanding, consent forms, policy compliance, et cetera. So you might notice um, that in terms of interoperability, you don't actually need an API for any of this. Uh, you can have a CSV that's standards-based and that's shared over SFTP with all the right BAs in place, and you would be all four levels of interoperable according to this framework. And indeed, this is how most people in healthcare think about interoperability. Um, they're not necessarily checking these boxes, but if you have standards-based CSVs being shared over SFTP um, and everybody's legally sharing them, then um, you're interoperable and people think that that's good enough. Um, and this is just the mentality that's everywhere. So yes, while CSVs over SFTP are better than faxing and having to hire individual people to go fax um, all of your clinical and lab results, um, it's really not good enough. Um, because the prevailing notion of healthcare interoperability focuses on making data exchange electronic. Um, and data exchange and true interoperability and like the power of transformation that we can talk about is just so much more than that. Um, I'm at API days and I assume I'm preaching to the choir about why this isn't enough, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna get into this. So we're gonna back up a little bit first, talk about the journey to interoperability, um, how we got here. Gonna go really fast. Um, maybe some people in the audience already know this, um, but we started with HL7 being created in 89 um, we then, there's some independent efforts around electronic medical records and companies like Epic and Cerner um, starting to be installed at hospitals to start to digitize the healthcare workplace and workflows. Um, there are a lot of disparate systems happening, a lot of frustration in the environment. And so then in 2004, the creation of the, op the, creation of the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT happened. Um, also known as the ONC, and you'll probably hear this a lot, especially if you're in healthcare. Um, and the ONC was kind of the first move towards actually trying to have a concrete role of government in health IT governance and technology um, progress and advancement. And that was then built on later in 2009 through the High Tech Act, which establishes meaningful use and requires interoperable electronic health records. Um, also in 2009, the ONC, issues fundings to states to create health information exchanges. Um, you can kind of think of these, and we're gonna see an example later, um, as the connectors. So say, you know, you have a, you have one health information exchange, they have to be nonprofit, um, they'll have their own software, they're both an organization and a software, they might be using open source software, they might be using a company like Epic and their, and their products. Um, and they are connecting all the different hospitals in the region who choose to connect and just getting data from them. So they are facilitating data exchange. Um, this has been have very varying levels of success. We're gonna talk about that a bit more later. Um, in 2000 level, 2011, a couple things happened. Um, we get Medicare and Medicaid incentive programs for EHRs now called promoting interoperability programs as of 2018, because um, interoperability is the big word. Um, also in 2011, FIRE first started, um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, they didn't actually publish their first um, version in 2014. And that's also when the Project Argonaut launched. 
Um, and this is a multi-stakeholder partnership to advance fire. It brought a lot of the major private companies and some of the nonprofits to the table and got them to commit to pushing fire forward. Um, and that's been pretty successful so far. Um, in 2018, CMS also launches the Blue Button 2.0 Fire API, which is one of the first and really canonical industry shaping examples of a Fire API. Um, and then there's, we're going to talk about some more examples later. And then in 2020, this year, um, ONC and CMS issue the final, the final rule of the Cures Act. We're going to get into that later. So just a timeline to help keep things kind of grounded. Um, likewise, I also want to talk about the users and stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem, um, primarily the patient. The patient is at the top of everything. Um, but there are so many other players and stakeholders in this industry, it's hard to keep track of them. And I'm sure this is not even an exhaustive list. Um, but really, I think the thing to keep in mind is that even if we're talking about interoperability between labs and their device manufacturers, the data that we're talking about is patient data. And the reason why we're here talking about it is to improve the health outcomes of patients. And so the patient really is the core to everything, even if they're not the direct beneficiary or direct user of their workflow. So what does this look like in a diagram? Um, from the 1990s, even to today, this is something that you could see. Super simplified example, um, but we have one patient, we have multiple health systems, including an independent clinician. Um, They're all exchanging data in different formats with custom on-prem, integrations. Um, some things are still involved, paper and email. Most notably, everything to the patient is basically a web portal, fax or email or paper. Um, and that is true for many patients today. Um, so some of the problems, again, these are um, custom one-off integrations. These integrations are not real time. Um, the structure and the semantics are not shared between systems. There's a huge burden and a risk of bad data quality and consistency. The patient can't really access their own data in electronic or usable format. Um, and the focus on moving data between systems is so burdensome that it takes precedent over making data usable and actionable, resulting in multiple complex screens of information that providers end up ignoring. So I challenge you next time you go to a healthcare provider, ask to just watch their workflow, ask to just see what they're doing on their screen. Um, and nine times out of 10, you're gonna see some pretty, pretty grim UI and just an information overload because the builders were too busy focusing on data and not on workflow, and not on users. Uh, so interoperability phase two, so enter fire, enter health information exchanges, enter these things called interface engines and the companies who provide them. Um, and we start to see some consolidation. Um, we start to see um, at least now companies are able to um, potentially just connect to one thing or connect to a couple things instead of doing a lot of, a lot of custom build. Um, HIEs and HINs, so health information exchanges and health information networks, are also adding the value of being a data store. So they're doing some normalization and cleaned up data. Um, this all allows more players to enter the market, which is exciting. It enables academics and researchers to have one place to go, or at least fewer places to go to get data they need to do good research. Um, and also, software developers and stakeholders can finally focus on adding value rather than exchanging data if they have fewer people to go to to get the data and they can hopefully get better data. Um, some problems, basically all the, all the problems still exist from before, um, especially now that um, you know, there is more interoperability, there's more connections and easier connections and faster connections, but we're still seeing that patients still can't get their own data in an electronic or machine readable format. Um, and that's just not acceptable in 2020. Um, we do see the interface engines, you know, these companies who are focused on basically building and selling APIs, um, they are providing some value and they're selling that value. Um, so, you know, that's, that's good because they're starting to add to the structure and semantics. Um, it's kind of a bummer when they choose not to use Fire, um, but we're gonna talk about that in a second um, because some of them aren't using Fire and they're just kind of building proprietary APIs on top of the already difficult APIs. Um, but we're going to talk about that in a sec. So um, we have five minutes left, so I'm trying to go through this fast. Um, so how do we get from this interoperability ecosystem, this kind of messy ecosystem um, that has a very, in some ways, limited, but also expansive and maybe not lofty enough goal of interoperability to APIs? Um, and how do we leverage APIs change 
um, that benefits patients and ultimately transforms American healthcare. Well, uh, the first thing is to acknowledge that the 1990s aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Modernization takes time and investment. You know, these hospitals have already invested millions, if not billions of dollars into their on-prem electronic health record systems that power, you know, some, you know, sometimes hundreds of thousands of patients a year. Um, and they're not going to be changing those anytime soon. Um, so we, while we modernize, this is going to be a long process. Um, but at the same time, we have to be investing in open standards-based infrastructure, like open source software and fire APIs, um, and just the concept of open standards in general. Um, you know, we have fire now, maybe in 20 years, we won't have fire, but we have to be focused on providing value and having open standards that we're all part of collaborating and adding to, um, to make sure that we can adapt when we want to change the standard and that we can make standards that are good for us, um, which is goes into another point I have later. Um, but this is going to take time and, you know, we're going to have to just make good progress um, as we start to shift the industry forward. Um, second, we have to refactor interoperability into API strategy. So we really shouldn't be using this word interoperability anymore, um, even though I know I will continue to use it probably for a long time. But we have to change the conversation to be about API strategy. We have to talk about continuous API product development. We have to think about APIs and integrations as products. And we have to understand the why from the beginning to the end. It can't just be about data exchange. We have to understand how the data we're exchanging leads to data-driven goals and measures of success and real outcomes. And we have to make sure users are part of the cycle and that you know, providers are the ones who are owning their workflows and able to you know, help guide software development and product decisions that help empower them as opposed to burden them. And we have to make sure that patients are top and center for all the decisions that we're making, even if they're not a direct user of our product. Um, and we also have to acknowledge that discovery and promotion matter, and we have to stop building silos and invest in developer experience um, so that we treat developers and the healthcare ecosystem as first class users too. Um, thirdly, we need to design standards with users, users being the implementers. Um, FIRE is being increasingly adopted, learning from adoption. Pretty excited about a lot of the work the FIRE community is doing and the multi-stakeholder groups that um, they've actively been forming to push the standards forward and getting use and adoption. Um, and then we also see CMS at the forefront and implementing APIs using these new FIRE standards and also collaborating and giving back to the FIRE community as they learn by doing. Um, this was one of the kind of criticisms for a while is that FIRE just isn't used like it should be. Um, and therefore, sometimes its design doesn't reflect learnings from actual use, but that is actively changing. Um, and people are using it and the FIRE community is uh, collaborating and connectathons are great. So um, finally, um, as we saw with interoperability, government was a driving force. Government made interoperability happen in an ecosystem that was so against change and still is against change. Um, and just like it drove interoperability, it is driving APIs. So we just saw the Cures Act final rule come out, which mandates patient access APIs. It requires that patients can electronically access all of their electronic health information, structured or otherwise, at no cost. It requires that provide, there be a provider directory um, from your insurance companies so that you can um, have an API that exposes all the providers that you are in your network. Um, it mandates pair-to-pair -pair data exchange through standards. I um, mean, so much more. And we also see government bodies like CMS and the Department of Veterans Affairs making great API products that are standards and fire uh, based and also in the cloud. Um, so it's really great to see government really pushing this forward. Um, and I know that they will continue to do so with the adoption and the implementation of APIs. So we are on the journey to better health outcomes and value for patients. And as I said at the beginning, for the American public, um, for healthcare in general, for the long run, and for the current pandemic situation we're in. And let's reach our destination, not through interoperability, but through user-focused, patient-centered, standards-based APIs. So thank you, and please come join me at USDS because we're great. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Shelby. Um, we don't really have time to take questions right now, but if you do have anything for... Uh, for Shelby, please reach out to her on Twitter or here in the app, um, and uh, I know she'll be very happy to help uh, help answer your questions. Thanks again, Shelby. It's really good to see you. 
um, and maybe we can uh, catch up uh, sometime soon.